मैं प्रोफेसर हमीदा नईम साहबा से गुजारिश करती हूँ कि वो अपना खुतबा यहाँ पेश करें प्रोफेसर हमीदा नईम साहबा डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इंग्लिश यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ काश्मीर In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Let me first of all, Urdu ka wo kya kehte hain? Ehsan mante hue wadi Kashmir ki taraf se yahan ke tamam hazrat ko khawatin hazrat ko main pyar bara salam arz karti hu. और जो मैं कहने जा रही हूँ, I I had I I should be pardoned for speaking English because I think most of the people will not be maybe not be very well versed with the phraseology I'll be using, but those who are connected with feminist theory and practice they can understand. So my audience will be solely and wholly that, but I will you should give me you should forgive me for not actually speaking two languages because that will take a lot of time. And I am really encouraged by the comment which Amina Kishore made about the book, that in spite of the fact that Amina has made a distinction between Western feminism and the rest of the feminism, but we also need to come out of the cloister, out of the mindset in which we blindly ape the West without questioning its postulates, without questioning its assumptions, and wholesale apply that feminism to our needs which are different, to our local needs, to our uh, uh, needs which are specific to the third world, to our needs which are specific to certain religions. And that is why there has been a backlash from the fanatics in different religions including Islam where women are being dragged back to the 14th century. You understand? That's very important. And that is why my, uh, I will be critiquing this human rights, women's human rights as a feminist discourse. Because in the recent times, feminism has increasingly been defying itself, defining itself in opposition to universalism and to the discourses of modernist feminist framework of human rights. By which I mean, in spite of the fact that women's human rights are conceived largely in terms of the broader modernist human rights framework, which is elaborated and put forth by United Nations, but we have been blindly actually accepting it without saying whether it is relevant to our situation or not. The struggle for more rights is not the question, is not the point under discussion but certain assumptions that underline this framework and is missed wittingly or unwittingly by feminists. Just as there has been an interrogation of the essentialist postulates, assumptions of the first wave feminism by the third world feminism, by the black feminism, there has also been an interrogation of the basic assumptions of the human rights discourse vis-a-vis -vis feminist discourse. By which I mean that the interrogation has been on the basis of different class, different religion, different take on the race and different traditions and cultures which we have in the third world, post-colonial world. You understand what I'm saying? So today my purpose is not to take the post-modernist or post-structuralist critique of the human rights discourse because post-modernism ultimately, in spite of the fact that it may dismantle the patriarchal structures, it does not help to build new structures which are inclusive. That means it does not help any grand narrative to flourish for either emancipation of women or the freedom of women or the human rights of women in the genuine sense. I would rather confine myself on the traditionalistic interrogation of this framework, of the human rights framework. The inherent paradox that feminism is basically about women's socio-economic, cultural, and political rights, yet it is not comfortable with the modernist 
feminist discourse needs some consideration. And this is what I will concentrate on. Just as I already said, there has been third wave feminism suspects the basic assumptions of second wave feminism, which they think is based on the experiences of the white middle class, educated, privileged women, and therefore does not take into consideration the other realities of race, class, religion, and colonial subjugation in which women are doubly colonized because their concerns are not covered in the universalistic and essentialistic framework of the modern feminist discourse. By the same analogy, we can interrogate the Western human rights framework for being based on modernist notion of individual remember and his relation to the community. The modern capitalist notion of the individual on which human rights framework is based is flawed from traditionalist perspective because on the one hand it rejects trans individual reality like God and religion and on the other, give us overriding importance to, to the individual at the expense of the community. The rejection of trans individual reality cannot be accepted by women in the traditional societies in which I also live, uh, and you also live, and we are part of that, as it is very lifeblood, because it is a very lifeblood that forms the warp and woof of our existence, that is the religious culture, whether it is Muslims or whether it is Hindus. Both of us, we have interiorized the tradition and we cannot throw it away on the demands of the Western feministists, which is a totally secularized discourse and therefore it rejects and discredits any connection with God or the, what I call, trans-individual reality. The question arises, who can speak for women in the third world that have interiorized tradition? Not even Supivak. Traditional woman is a species of subaltern who cannot be spoken for by a modernist feminist. The argument put forth by some of the feministists that challenging artificial cultural unity of women's experience will hinder the project of prioritizing women's concerns in the international affair does not hold uh, ground because they miss the point as another critic and abundant argues that culture and gender critiques of the dominant discourse are interrelated and necessary aspects of a project for women's genuine empowerment. She further contends that international women's rights will not have the support of diverse women worldwide until the cultural assumptions within international human rights norms of interrogated along with the gendered premises of those norms. To ignore the importance of culture, race, class, sexuality, and history ends up leaving feminist theory within international human rights theoretically impoverished and strategically weak. Could I have some water? My contention is that although one may imagine other societies must enter modernity and can't afford isolationism and resistance against globalized capitalism, one can't pontificate or legislate on their behalf. My contention is that the feminist discourse has not sufficiently theorized, this is my basic contention, that feminist discourse has not sufficiently theorized the more basic ontological questions and has rather uncritically aligned itself with liberal humanism and modern secularized discourse. As current dilemmas and contradictions can be traced back to this fateful alliance. Secularized feminist intellectual can't represent the women as issues in traditional communities where faith is unproblematically giving meaning to lives and motivations for action. I extend the argument of Supivak against Kristeva to argue that the third world women, especially the women in rural areas, cannot be spoken for. And to talk of their oppression may also be misleading. The Western notion of capitalist individualism upon which the human rights framework is largely based can lead to this rejection by cultures and traditional societies that also suspect expansion of Westernization. For instance, when Western feminists argued that basic 
human rights of women in Afghanistan were denied. The political interest is motivating U.S. elites to invade the country was conveniently forgotten by those feministists. Those human rights were not taken into consideration. They went there only to release women from the burqa and killing five, at least five lakh people at, in one go. And what about those writers? This is the basic contradiction in this human rights, uh, in, in this human rights project. Further modernist secularized understanding of human rights has the potential, or oh, in Iraq, half a million babies died because they could not get baby food for the sanctions which are imposed on it by the US government. And Marilyn Albright was the foreign secretary at that time. Being a woman, she could take all that because they had to teach a lesson to Saddam Hussein at the expense of the rights of women and children. You can see these are the loopholes of this modernist humorized discourse which gives individual overriding importance and tries to divide him, take him away from the community of which he is a part. Activists have noticed that global human rights discourse does not always follow the needs of local people and does not take structural inequalities into account. Historically, as all of us know, feminism arose as a reaction against a semi-feudal and later industrialized society. It did seek to articulate the otherwise little notes to oppression, but it found ally in the secularized patriarchal political discourse rather than traditional religious one. In spite of the fact in the beginning, feministists always tried to ask for their writers by reinterpreting certain uh, terms in the scripture, whether it was in the Bible or, I mean, uh, Muslims continue to do it, Islamic feminists continue to do, to do it even today, because that has been a reaction against the Western feminism, which is actually trying to pontificate and legislate on the basis of their conception of their experiences, which is totally not acceptable by the traditional society. This in spite of the fact, as I already said, that early feminists talked of women's rights only in theological terms and did not try to undercut the ontological basis of human rights. And even today you have Christian feminism, Islamic feminism, Muslim feminism, which are reactions to this monolithic, patriarchal, ideological, capitalistic discourse which the West is actually outsourcing to other third world countries. My point is that here we are talking of so-called mainstream essentialist feminism which indeed won many victories, there is no doubt about that, and the promised emancipation was felt to be around the corner, but which never happened. Because some Western feminists who understand all this, they also say, that you know what we actually asked for that has not been given to us by the men, they have pushed us aside, but they gave us sops in terms of jobs, economic empowerment, but the rest of the things have gone down the drain. This essentialist feminism is an elitist intellectual sponsored discourse that attracts a sizable chunk of middle class women, but little percentage of the lower rung of traditional societies actually joined it. Feminism has been also called as a luxury by these women. We may apply Foucault's conception of discourse to question the variant of modern secular feministists to criticize the traditional women in traditional societies which they try to bring them in their fold. In Foucault's view, a discourse is not simply a body of words and sentences, but the very structure in which the social world is constructed and control is an object of knowledge. What is more, Foucault argued that it's in discourse that power and knowledge are joined together. The study of discourse is thus inseparable from the study of institutional power, discipline, and domination in Western societies. Adopting Edward Said's the strategy in Orientalism, we can expand Foucault's analysis of regimes of discourse, power, and knowledge in Western societies by applying this model to what is really a form of colonialist feminist discourse. <coughs> Like Foucault and Said, we can see the will to know and understand the non-Western world in colonial discourse is inseparable from the will to power over that world. Framing traditional women <coughs> in the human rights feminist framework and then 
characterizing it as cap, uh, characterized it uh, by patriarchal, then characterized it as oppressed by patriarchal law and logic is characteristic of capitalist, imperialist, colonial approach. For traditional societies, feminism is complex with capitalism and other such ideologies that strip human beings of more primordial vocation and enslave them rather than emancipate them by naturally improving them, materially improving them. When feminism embraces the doctrine of autonomous individualism, it views work, including domestic work, as necessarily alienating, calling for compensation from the society. Then it has little room for more creative, fulfilling, and sublime aspects that essentially feminine activities have. It positives a view of society that embodies no symbols. I have already told her that I have to finish it. It positives a view of society that embodies no symbols, no supernatural vocation that would place everything in the context. We need to understand why great traditional scholars have castigated this kind of feminism as a stumbling block to women's genuine rights. History of the struggle of women's rights in the modernist framework is also a history of gradual fragmentation of society, of conflicts, of alienation, by modeling the notion of female subject on male subject. Women have got the right to education today, but no freedom from patriarchal oppression. Feminism, both liberal and Marxist varieties, has been wedded to modern social and political theory that explains everything with respect to tangible material realities and can't accommodate symbolist, metaphysical notions which are lifeblood of traditional societies. A traditional woman has theoretically no demands, and she commands respect and dignity by her love and devotion to the family, and thus the society. The modernist demand for rights is self-defeating and doesn't lead to definite solutions. Modern feminists are always complaining, and those who advocate others' cause are on the sum less alienated and escape the tragic failures of more pro-individualist stances, as Edward Said argues. Western colonial power over the non-Western oriental world is maintained in and through the discourses of arts, humanities, and social sciences, as well as through more direct forms of domination, such as political rule and military repression. Traditionalists would see feminism similarly as disguised internal colonialism that removes roadblocks in the way of capital. We can extend the argument of another case of Pivak essay, can the subaltern speak, to argue that much of the feminist thought is an imperialist construction and miserably distorts the picture of traditional societies and the representation of women in them. When the right to belief and thus access to source of meaning, joy, beauty, and ontological ground of justice snatched or discredited, how can call for other rights such as women's rights be much meaningful? For traditional women, there can be no emancipation outside God, outside tradition. Tradition is not to be understood as past slavery, as worship of the past, as some of the fanatics in Islam are trying to drag women back to the old times and try to apply those Sharia laws which were context-bound historically and cannot be supplanted in the modern times. They see it as complicit with feudalism and patriarchy, understood as unjust male domination treating women as commodity. Such a reading by feminists who read it as that is based on ignorance, if not deliberate misrepresentation. The conditions created by capitalist modernity are not the given natural reality, but need to be contested. Women are the chief victims of world march of capitalism. Although it has given some space for fighting some of the rights which traditionals did envisage, but this is again, again newly created alienation and oppression that they have found something of their own. As again as this, in traditional societies, these problems and this background was absent, and there was no need to fight for rights they didn't feel they have ever lost. lost. Capitalism and the reign of market that objectifies and commoditizes everything is incompatible with any conception of human rights, especially for those lower classes whose blood and sweat is used 
to create the empire of capital. Neither men nor women can be emancipated on the premises of enlightenment view of instrumental rationality. Rather modern culture industry and knowledge economy need sponsoring divisive discourses like feminism. I have seen this divisive discourses of feminism in Kashmir where the conflict created in innumerable violations of women's rights but these feministists come how have the women changed they are actually taking this everything away from the main political discourse separate single out women and say what have been the change that not how they have suffered how their rights have been violated but how they have been empowered because they come now and talk to police, talk to military, and to negotiate the release of their sons, or to negotiate the release of their husbands, but into the bargain, they are deflowered. They lose their chastity while they are doing this. This is the empowerment which they are always talking about, that they have become women negotiators. I have seen this, what has happened over time. And another, another, another complaint with Indian feministists has been they have not taken the genuine human rights approach to Kashmir issue in the sense they have never come in support of the women who have suffered because of state terrorism, because of the terrorism which the state has sponsored. They have forgotten their basic postulates so far as feminism is concerned because feminism rejects the idea of the nation state as it is given by modernists. The modern nation state is again a creation of the Western ideology of capitalism and therefore far removed from our needs. The need of the hour is that the Indian women also get their act together and take a stance which is worthy of them rather than align themselves with the nationalistic, brutal, violent stance of the patriarchal nation. Another thing, so far as the Muslim feminists are concerned, they should critique religion from within. They should not go and take the support from the uh, Western concepts because everything is given in Islam. It's a matter of interpretation. So far, there are key symbols in Quran which need reinterpretation vis-a-vis -vis women. That is what Islamic feminists are doing. The question is not to denounce religion, but Religion only can give you an ontological basis for fighting for your rights. If you deny that, then you are denying the life source. The thing is that you have to retrieve human rights, not only from the Western feminism, from Western human rights, but also you have to retrieve them from the fanatics who give a particular tribalized, feudalized interpretation of Islam. Thank you very much. <laughs>